I should first start off by asking, does anybody here have any experience with biofeedback or knowledge of biofeedback? Either that is to say, do they know what biofeedback is or have they had direct experience with biofeedback? Anybody at all? Knowledge of, what do we have back here? So back in the 70s when it first came out, and what kind of back in the 70s things were coming out? Use it to relax. That's very good. I saw another hand back here. So taking a physiology course taught you how to use biofeedback to relax. Did you have some? The Stanford Research Institute in the 70s had an opportunity to relax. So there are a number of notions of biofeedback as a relaxation technique, and that's a very important part of what we'll be doing tonight. The stress management theme for the mini med school goes right into the notion of biofeedback. But at the same time, there are a number of goals for this presentation tonight. And I wanted to double check, what would you like to go away with tonight? What, what do you want to learn from tonight's presentation based on any anticipation that you might have had coming here? What are some things I want to make sure to touch on? Does anybody have any preconceptions or some ideas? Yeah. How to approach borderline hypertension. Mechanisms of biofeedback. Are there any others? Yes. Research in the area of biofeedback. Pain. Weight control. A few others. Yes. Ah, yes. Talk on proper breathing and relaxation techniques. So we'll be able to, yes, some more? Say again. Finding a practitioner. Any others? Anything else to make sure to cover? So we'll be able to touch on most of those in some, to some degree, and some of them in greater depths than others. In terms of tonight's learning goals, what I hope to do is define a little bit about physiological psychology, how changes in the body affect the mind, applied psychophysiology and biofeedback, and we'll talk more about that. We're going to describe some of the clinical evidence for the efficacy of therapeutic biofeedback in various clinical settings. Review parts of psychophysiological measurement. Psycho for mind, physiology for body. So how do we measure the link between the thoughts and how the body responds? And these include simple things like how a person changes in heart rate or blood pressure. That goes to the hypertension issue. We'll talk about breathing and other types of measurement techniques. There have been two other pieces. One is stress profiling, and the other one is detecting deception. Detecting deception is pretty much a lie detector test that's come into the news recently at the American Psychological Association conference this past August when they were describing interrogation techniques. Do we need to be as harsh in order to get information for interrogation? So that's why that theme is up there. And we're going to survey the different biofeedback techniques that have been labeled or named things like neurofeedback, how we get brainwave information to the patient or client, general biofeedback, as well as the title of today's talk is Self-Mastery Beyond Pills. How do we start learning about ourselves so we can reduce the frequency and the dosage or the duration of taking pills? As well, we'll talk about identifying ways of finding qualified practitioners and how and where and what the certification processes are, things along those lines. When we think about medicine and what people do when they go to visit primary care providers, we know that a large part of it is stress-related illness. We've known for thousands of years that when people are under a lot of stress, they tend to get more colds and flu-like symptoms. We've known that if you're in a good mood, you tend to heal yourself faster. And therefore, there's a benefit to learning how to relax and to reduce the stress in your life. People also go to physicians for chest pains and dyspnea, 
irritable bowel, panic disorders, insomnia, anxiety in general. We give a lot of prescriptions for anxiolytic medications, anxiety-reducing medications, headache, back pain, fibromyalgia. There are any number of things that are very much the domain of biofeedback research and clinical application. And mostly what the physicians are trained to do is treat things that are other than colds and flus. You can push medications at colds and flus, and you can medicate the symptoms of a lot of these other areas, but the training is not as extensive. It's mostly just treat the symptoms. If we think about the types of things that physicians are trained to do, it's trying to understand at what point in your lifespan to prescribe a different type of pill, a different type of medication. So a little bit of humor just to remind us that there are things beyond the pills. When we think about how often something is done, it's frequency. Intensity is the notion of dosage in this case, and time or duration. Frequency, intensity, and time duration are the standards of comparison to identify how a patient is moving, reducing the frequency, the dosage, or the duration of taking pills is a way to chart progress. And that's what we're going to do today, is talk about how biofeedback can be used adjunctively to help reduce the frequency, the intensity, or the dosage, and the duration of taking medications. Let's do a demonstration. This little cartoon says that there's a communication link between our thoughts and what's going on in our belly or our body. So since it's Halloween, I need a victim. I need somebody who's willing to be brave enough to come on up and do a little demonstration. Who wants to? All right, there you go. Nice and easy. This device looks like a computer mouse. I'm going to connect it up to a uh, loudspeaker. Please have a seat. Please have a seat. And I'm going to have you put your hand in here, just like a computer mouse, and I'm going to adjust this dial. So it's really low. So, you know, one might say that he's kind of, you know, it's quiet or, you know, it's not quite dead, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a low arousal level. But all of a sudden we hear something going up. We hear the tone increasing. Now, <clears throat> Why is it changing? That's a really good question. Why is it changing? Let's see what happens as, as I get closer. Ah, you like me, huh? <laughs> ah, now that got a thought. Now there's a relationship between the thoughts and how the body responded in this case, isn't there? One might argue. There's any number of ways. Try to make the sound go down. Oh, practice. Oh, make it go down faster. There's an old phrase, hurry up and relax. <laughs> Clearly a skilled practitioner and a meditator, but at the same time, once you draw social evaluative threat or concern or, or appraisal onto the situation, we get a change in the signal. What I'd like to do is turn this down just a little bit, and I'm going to answer a question. What is what on the measurement? What is the variable? It's a great question. Um, may I um, hold this for a moment? This device is a galvanic skin response monitor. It has two little metal pieces that react to basically the stress response, or in this case, the sweat response. So when the sympathetic nervous system becomes aroused, we sweat some more. In the typical places that we sweat the most, the largest distribution of the sweat glands will be the palmar surfaces of the hands and the feet and of course the armpits and, and near the groin area. And you can place the sensors, in this case these two metal um, pieces, I'm amplifying the sound, and there's a close relationship to our arousal and the amplified sound that's occurring, in this case, on this little speaker. That's a great question. The comment was it's a blood pressure indicator and it's not quite blood pressure. What it is is general arousal of the system. So each one of you has a system that reacts to the world around you and part of the reaction is based on your thoughts and how your thoughts communicate or react with the body. So the body is showing, up, showing how the thoughts are reacting or responding and there's a link or a close relationship to how we sweat. There's also a link to our heart rate, and to our blood pressure, and to our muscle tension, and to our breathing, and any another number of systems. And I promise you that we will get to a demonstration. We have a whole 
polygraph here, and we'll do a full stress profile by the end of the evening, but this is just a quick little uh, beginning, and I'm going to pass this around so people can see it. I would like to thank our uh, presenter, and then I'll answer some more questions. Um, so I'm just going to start passing this little device around. It will make a little squeaking sound. There's a little dial that you can rotate on the side. If you had an earphone, you'd plug it in, you'd do your own little private biofeedback session. And these are about 100 bucks or so. The thermometers that, that I'll show you later are about $10. These are about $100. The polygraphs are several thousand dollars, but, but we'll talk about that uh, as we go on. So just feel free to, to use it or play with it and handle it. I'm going to answer a question back here. It's a great question. The comment was, if people sweat, this device will monitor the sweat reactions of the people. But what if you have hot flashes? What if you're a woman going through hot flashes and you're sweating in different places or in different ways? We, there's a set on sli slides at B in the handouts on uh, just that issue. And we can talk about how biofeedback can be applied for hot flashes. But just as a brief preview, the simple idea is, is that we can reduce the intensity as well as the frequency of, our, of hot flashes if you're going through different menopausal symptoms by learning how to listen to our body and so that the duration will be reduced. But if we, if we just let things go, you can choose the location of the sensor with a different type of device as opposed to using the hands. This is shaped like the hands in a computer mouse. But we can place the sensors pretty much anywhere on the body that's necessary. And we'll talk more about that and place sensors all over the place. I'm going to move to some definitions of biofeedback. The first are definitions that I mentioned earlier in the um, objectives for tonight about physiological psychology, how changes in the body, i.e., if we drink alcohol, if we take medications or use uh, street drugs, if we have a lot of stress hormone going through our system, all of those substances are going to affect the way people think and feel. Let's flip around these two words. Now we look at psychophysiology, how changes in your thoughts can affect how your body reacts. And that's mostly the domain of biofeedback, because we're trying to identify how your thoughts are linked to your body's reactions to stressful circumstances. A definition of biofeedback is that it's an evidence-based approach, and we'll talk more about the evidence for this approach, to enhance awareness, personal awareness, and control over the body and the mind. So that's a very simple definition. There are many more technical definitions. There are some in the handouts, but for simplicity's sake, I rearranged the handouts a little bit. So if you're not following exactly on the handouts, that's by design. Go with the, go with the slide set for now. All the information that's in the handouts is somewhere later on probably in the slide set, but it is there. There are other ideas about what the myths of biofeedback are. Some people think biofeedback is only about relaxing. And there have been many advances to say that it's not just a relaxation therapy. It's about optimizing physiological functioning or mind-body functioning. If you think of the metaphor of a line, when people are below their line, they're anxious and nervous and out of sorts and feeling bad and not having all types of symptomatology. We are looking forward to the time of getting back to comfort zone, getting back to base, to something that's familiar. There's also the idea of going above and beyond our line, where we want to increase or enhance or optimize our functioning. That's also part of the domain of biofeedback because we can go to peak performance. And this is done in mostly, say, for example, the Olympic training centers in Colorado. When people want to go above and beyond what would, they would normally do as performance, they can use biofeedback to give them information about their muscle performance and about their different types of physical attributes. So we can go in both directions. Biofeedback is an observatory model. A medication is doing something to you. A surgery is doing something to you. A physical therapist will move your body and manipulate it. A biofeedback session is about giving you information to take control and make choices that are better for you. So nothing is being done to you. But what it does is it makes you more aware so that you can facilitate your own regulatory processes. Self-regulation, or the ability to regulate your own process, is enhanced with greater information. And it's better to get more precise or useful information by using instruments or equipment, because sometimes we can't always tell. Sometimes a person will say, I'm not under stress. 
and what they're telling you and what you can see are two different things. So we can use a biofeedback device to place a muscle monitor on their shoulders and identify they know they're under stress, they don't know how much stress they're under. So we can use instruments to identify the frequency of muscle tightening, the intensity of their muscle reactions, and how long they keep their muscles tight, or the duration. So frequency, intensity, and time duration are ways to make comparisons and they facilitate self-regulation. Most biofeedback approaches are complements to psychology and medicine. We'll talk more about that. It's an adjunctive technique. And one last thing from the 70s, it's not biorhythms. Because as uh, some of you have heard of the notion of biorhythms, but just, I just needed to put it up there. It's a not, not a biorhythm technique. Let me give you one more demonstration of this mind-body link or mind-body connection, this psychophysiology. If you could get in a comfortable position, and what I'd like everyone to do is join me with a very, very brief imagery technique of just a few minutes. So get in a comfortable position now. And if you weren't in a comfortable position already, ask yourself why you weren't in a comfortable position already. Because this is an easy and friendly kind of classroom. So uh, that's just a bit of biofeedback. You're observing yourself. The second piece is feel comfortable to close your eyes. And I'm going to talk about a lemonade imagery in a moment. As you sit there comfortably breathing, I'd like you to begin to close your eyes and get more and more relaxed as we start beginning this imagery. Imagine, if you could, that there's a house somewhere in a climate zone that has citrus trees. And in the backyard of this house are lemon trees that have nice, ripe, juicy, organic, flavorful lemons. You go into the house and out to the backyard and pick some of these nice, ripe, juicy lemons. Imagine as you pick them, you can feel the moistness, of the stickiness of the rind and the lemons as you place them into some kind of container to carry them back into the house. Just take a few. As you go into the house, you find a well-stocked kitchen. In this kitchen, there's a counter with a cutting board. There's a knife block. There's a sink. There's a cupboard with sweetener in it that we'll get to in a little bit. There's glasses. There's pictures. There's all the things that you would need to make a nice, fresh glass of lemonade. If you could, take the lemons and put them into the sink. Wash them off. Dry your hands with a towel. Pick up one of the ripe, juicy lemons. Hold it in one hand. Place it on the cutting board. Get a knife from the knife block, slice into one of the lemons. Some of you might have imagined a little squirt of lemon juice. It might have reached your hand or even your cheek. You can start feeling the astringency of the lemon juice. Place the knife down and take one half of the lemon. Find a cup and by hand start squeezing with that one half of your hand one half of the lemon, squeeze more of the juice into the glass. And as you're squeezing the juice, you can again feel the stickiness and the moistness. You can smell the rich flavor of the lemon juice as it's beginning to accumulate at the bottom of the glass with anything else that pits and seeds and anything else that's coming into the glass. As soon as you're done squeezing as much of the juice as you can comfortably out of that lemon, you then take that half of a lemon, put it into the sink, and take the other half of the lemon. Continue squeezing a little bit more. Continue to get some more juice out of the second half of the lemon into this glass as you accumulate more and more fresh squeezed lemon juice. And when you're done with that half of a lemon, place that one in the sink as well. Wash your hands. Feel the change in the texture of the hands when they were washed off. Dry your hands. And then look at that glass of fresh squeezed lemon juice that's just lemon juice. Go over to the glass and pick it up and swirl it around under your nose, smelling the fresh squeezed lemon juice. Then you decide to take the glass, 
bring it up to your lips, tip it back, and just try to taste some of that very fresh, raw, fresh squeezed lemon juice. And you can feel something and taste something. You decide that you do want to add some sweetener to taste, create this lemon juice glass in any way that you want. You can take out pits, you can do whatever you want to make this one of the best tasting glasses of lemonade. Find some sweetener of choice, add some water, some ice, some stirring spoon. Go ahead and stir up one of the best glasses of lemonade that you've had in a long time. Feel comfortable to take a sip or two or to finish the glass of lemonade at your leisure and at your pleasure. Mm. At your leisure and pleasure, continue knowing that someone will clean up this imaginary kitchen, that we're going to start making our way back to this room, to the sound of my voice. And in a moment, I'll ask each of you to begin rousing, to open up your eyes, to orient back to where we are now. And when you're done with this miniature vacation, this very small imagery exercise, please make your way back and open up your eyes. So what I'd like to do is ask a question. What kind of experiences did people have? What kind of experiences did people have when we did that little imagery exercise? Who had some experiences? Yeah, a little bitter tasting. Anybody else? Yes. A tanginess in one's nostrils. So the citric acid, you can sort of taste it or experience it. Yeah, in the nose. Anybody else experience anything? Yeah. Pleasure, generally pleasurable feeling. Maybe, yeah. Salivated when you put the glass back. Was that for you as well? Was there a glass of lemonade in the room? Did your mind fool your body into thinking that something was going on? That's psychophysiological interaction. Biofeedback is about enhancing the awareness between the power that the mind has to change physical responses or physiological reactions. Applied psychophysiology and biofeedback is a tool to monitor physiological signals and display them in real time. And it says display, but I would also say project or transmit, because a minute ago we did an auditory sound uh, of the physical reaction. So it's pretty much any type of feedback that you're going to get, whether it's auditory, whether it's visual, and then sometimes it's even kinesthetic. When working with folks who are low vision or blind, there are sensor pads that you can place on their backs, for example, and they can get the equivalent of the increasing or the decreasing felt sense on their back. So it's amazing the range of types of things. There are, you know, who's ever heard of smell-o-vision? Smell-o-vision. What's smell-o-vision? Yeah. Scratch and sniffs thing to go with the movies. That's brilliant. You used to go to the movies, and they would say, go ahead and scratch now. And you would be able to smell what was going on in the thing. And some, some, there's all kinds of technologies out there. When you go to Las Vegas, they would pump in apple pie scent because that calms people down and makes them spend more money. In some ways, there's not just visual and auditory or kinesthetic, but there's even olfactory, in this case, a sense of smell, or even, I don't know of any gustatory biofeedback, except that when you eat a delicious meal, you're going to get some sense of pleasure and you're going to get some feedback from how you're eating. So even those senses can be uh, considered in a biofeedback way. Biofeedback is a systematic tool for taking signals and displaying them in real time or giving you information in real time. It's a mirror that increases the signal to the noise ratio. A lot of us have a lot of noise going on in our heads and a lot of noise going on in our lives. There are two basic principles. Relaxation techniques typically reduce the noise. If you go to a yoga class, the techniques of yoga, for example, if you go to a relaxation or a meditation class, the te techniques of meditation or relaxation classes are designed to help quiet the noise. Biofeedback, typically with instrumentation, is a way to amplify the signal, to take signals of your sweat 
and make them visible or auditory or more aware or more available to you in a way that you might not have been aware of before. So biofeedback in an applied sense is also a way to change the signal to the noise ratio. <clears throat> Sometimes the signals can be inaccurate. Sometimes we don't know how accurate our mirror is. And this is just a little bit of humor. We have a, a woman who is slender and thinking she's not, and a man who is not slender and thinking he is, as an example. So accuracy is a big piece. I'm going to talk about a couple pieces here. Biofeedback in this frame is making the visible, I'm sorry, makes visible the invisible. And I'll talk about these three pieces. Uh, an example here and internal thoughts and reactions, as well as muscle bracing. And I'll use the, uh, the person here. <clears throat> One of the things in a biofeedback session is setting up a baseline, trying to figure out where people are in relationship to their physiological reactions. What I'd like to do is take you through this slide, and then we'll do a little demonstration. The first one was, having a person sigh three times. When they sighed three times, it constricted their blood vessels. So these lines are representations of how the blood is moving through their body, and it's called the blood volume pulse uh, relationship. And when they sighed three times, there was a constriction or a reduction in blood volume going through their system. Then this other one was a clap and it re resulted in a um, reduction in blood volume. Then they closed their eyes, and I'll explain this one in a moment, and then they were talking about stress. We'll come back to this. Let me give you a quick demonstration. Would everybody please observe yourself? Just watch how your body is feeling at the moment. You're probably feeling you're breathing normally. You're not paying attention to anything in particular. What I'd like you to do is exhale almost like a gasping sigh, like a <sighs> three times. <sighs> now watch your body. How does it feel? What are you experiencing? Was there any change? What do you feel? Cold. Anybody else? What do you feel? Lightheaded. Lightheaded. Anybody else? What did you say? The baby was, was talking. Okay. Some people felt relaxed. Some people feel tingles. Some people feel different. It's just different than it was before. And part of that is the restriction in, blood, in um, blood volume. Less blood getting to the head or cold means that there's less warm blood flowing through your system. And those are just two examples and there are many, many others. So that's a typical response. That's normal, anticipated, and expected. So that's what this one is and that's an expected response. Now what I'd like you to do is everybody close their eyes for a moment. Everybody has their eyes closed? Okay, now, <laughs> right, that should have woken up for everybody, yes? Okay, what I did is a loud clap just when I was telling you to relax and your eyes were closed and you thought we were going to do a nice little other imagery exercise and I tricked you, this trick or treat, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we'll get some more treats later on. But the point is that your body reacted in somewhat of a startle reflex, yes? We braced, we tightened, that's very, very typical as a reaction. So we have a constriction in blood vessel and that's anticipated or expected. This particular person, let me go back one slide, 32-year-old athlete who is anxious, perfectionistic, and vigilant. In this case, hypervigilant. When they closed their eyes, they also had a constriction in the blood vessels. But when that person thought about a stressful event, they had a nice flow of blood. That's paradoxical. It doesn't make sense. If I said, close your eyes now and think of something stressful, most of us would be going and tightening up and stressing out. So what was going on here for this individual is we didn't know it, but her issue, it was a woman, was to be in control. She wanted to be in control of every moment. When she closed her eyes, she didn't know what was going on around her. She was concerned. It might have been, you know, what, what else is going on around me when she closed her eyes? So for that person, closing their eyes wasn't a relaxing thing. It was the thing that made her feel like she lost control. And in the biofeedback session, rather in, the, in a clinical session, a psychological session, 
the psychologist would say, I'd like you to close your eyes and go ahead and relax and then think about something stressful. The thinking about something stressful was a walk in the park for them because they could control every moment. They might not have liked it, but they, they could remember and they were in control when they were thinking about stress. When they were out of control was when their eyes were closed. So biofeedback is a tool sometimes for making visible the invisible. Let me give you another example. This is a 52-year-old uh, uh, custodian, and they have a number of different squiggles and graphs that we'll talk over uh, a little bit. We have a, a breathing uh, signal, and we have a muscle signal, but one of the signals was in their arm where they were complaining about pain. Now, as a custodian, one of the things that they had to do was wash floors by hand. For whatever reason, that was part of the, the specific task that they were complaining about. And they had been seeing their physical and occupational therapist, who they reported they loved. They said, this person is wonderful. They're taking good care of me. They do a great job. And they make me feel good afterwards. But I'm still in pain. And we couldn't quite figure it out. They were breathing with sound. There's lots of relaxation techniques that are giving a nice little long exhale, like a ah as opposed to a gasping sigh, which is, oh, this is a nice, long, relaxing sound. Sometimes people make long sounds to relax, and we were looking at how they were relaxing. When they make a gasping sound in a relaxation exercise, their muscle tension was fairly low. One of the activities was we couldn't figure out what was going on with their arm, because that's where they were reporting all their muscle pain. What I'd like everybody to do now, if you could, in your seats, is just lift up your arm in front of you, and then for a moment, just let it go limp. Just let it flop. And do that one more time and let it flop. Good. Would you pretty much say that your arms are relaxed now? Okay. That's exactly what this person reported. Go ahead and hold your arm up again. And I'm going to do this for just a little while longer. Now, tell me when you start feeling something in your arm. That's about 15 seconds you start feeling something. Anybody else start feeling something? Yeah, it's, uh, 40 seconds. 30. After about 30 seconds, maybe a minute, go ahead and put your arms down. You can start feeling things in your arm. All of a sudden, it's stressful. But for most of us, we can raise our arms and let it flop down, and we are relaxed. Yes? The, the vertical variable, uh, there's four lines. The first two have to do with breathing, which we'll describe a little bit more later as we go to the squiggles and the graphs. And the second two have to do with different muscles. And no, nothing to do with the heart in this case. In this case, the vertical bar is representing how much muscle tightness or muscle tension there is. Yeah. So the things that are circled down here, this big red one, this big spike, if you will, what was going on with this particular patient is that they lifted up their arm and they let it go, and most of us are able to release or relax our muscles. They were not. It's as if they were walking around like this. It's as if they were not letting go completely. Again, I'm exaggerating. Just looking at me doing this is stressful, isn't it? It's kind of like the Quasimodo Halloween outfit. Had to do a little Halloween here and there. So the point is, is that making, the, making visible the invisible is part of the technique or the approach that's included in most biofeedback therapeutic sessions. And so it's just awareness raising, but it's not just awareness raising. It's specific awareness raising. It's how do you become aware? When a person says relax, what does that mean? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Biofeedback is used to assess and document change in many ways. We want to go ahead and do a physiological assessment. We'll get to a stress profile or an assessment of physiological reactivity. We want to look at different types of patterns. Here's a nice one, learned disuse. Learned disuse. If a person is injured, let's use the example of the custodian. If a person is injured, they start using some sets of muscles in favor of the ones that they were using before. So they start learning to disuse the ones that were in pain and using a different group of muscles. So we can actually learn disuse, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about incontinence. I'll give you a preview. Incontinence is the idea that if we have pelvic pain in the pelvic floor muscles, we can start using another set of muscles to, to um, take over, but at the same time, we need to tighten the, the sphincter in order to keep the muscles, um, to keep the, uh, uh, 
the fluids in. And so the idea is, is that we, can, we are learning to disuse the muscles that are in pain if they were injured in any way or uh, say during childbirth, sometimes they're cut during an episiotomy, there's any number of things. We'll, we'll get to this in more detail. I just wanted to give you a preview of the general concept. But we learn to disuse certain muscle groups with biofeedback. We can relearn to use the muscles that were previously unlearned. Is that a fair way to explain it? Okay. Here's a fancy term for you, dysponesis. Who's heard of that term? Anybody? Okay. Think of the Greek for work. The old Greek for work is ponis, P-O-N-E-S. The Greek word for exertion is ponesis. So ponis and ponesis are similar concepts, work and exertion. If we put a dis in front of it, we get the concept of bad work, overexertion, excess effort, work that's not used in, in an appropriate way. Biofeedback is very much about reducing dysponetic action, overexertion. It's not that we react. Everybody reacts to stress. We all go from zero to 100 miles an hour at times, but we want to quickly reduce our reactivity. We want to go to recovery phase faster. So biofeedback helps us reduce dysponesis and we can identify these patterns, these psychophysiological patterns using biofeedback techniques. And again, it's not often taught this way in the medical school. Pretty much you take painkillers and muscle relaxants and that's the main way to treat some of the musculoskeletal as well as some other types of disorders. There's a lot of objective data. You do in a pre and a post uh, intervention effect. You can look at ergonomics and work style. Um, I'll talk more about that later on, but just as a preview, um, if a person is typing on a keyboard and all of a sudden their boss walks in, now I'm pounding down with a hundred times more effort than I need to type. Is it necessary to put all that effort into the keyboard? If you do that repeatedly, we get repeated stress injuries of different types. And so biofeedback can place little muscle sensors and alert you when you're overexerting yourself. Again, dyspnoetic activity, but it goes squarely in the, um, and the same thing with other physiological response patterns. The other thing that we can do is change a person's belief. A lot of us are not aware of what we're capable of physically. Biofeedback can enhance our awareness of what we can and cannot do. And we'll talk about a couple of differences. It doesn't even always require instrumentation. Let me give you a brief demonstration. Uh, let's have everybody stand up. Is that okay? I'm going to do a stretch break. <clears throat> and what I'd like you to do is as you're looking straight, put your thumb in front of your arm, in front of your face, look at your thumb, and just try to track your thumb back as far as you can and mark a spot on the wall as far back as you can move. Do this comfortably. It's not a strain. It's just a comfortable thing. And then mark a spot where you think as far as you've been able to move and then come back up to the front. Okay? Next. Next step. And then put your hands down. Next step that I'd like you to do is I'd like you to turn your eyes to the left. So look, head straight, but look left but turn your head to the right. Look left, turn your head to the right. Looking left. So as you're turning your head over your right shoulder, you should be looking towards the screen. Does that kind of make sense? Now what I'd like you to do is head straight again. I'd like you to look right, but rotate your head to the left. So rotate your head to the left and move your eyes towards the screen again. And move your eyes to the screen. Oh, uh, keeping your head left, but your eyes only moving to the screen. Okay. The next phase, and move, look straight again, the next phase is take your hand, your, your right thumb, move your right thumb to the left, but look uh, and move your head to the right. And then the next one is, I'd like you to turn your head to the right, and arms to the right, head to the left, eyes to the right. Okay, now I'd like you to come back and relax. The next phase, and this is the last piece, I'd like you to take your thumb, look at your thumb, and now what I'd like you to do is rotate around again and mark a spot on the wall and see whether you could have moved further than the first time. Okay? All right. Now, one last demonstration, last, last piece. What I'd like you to do is take your shoulders up towards your ear 
and now try to rotate your arm. Does it work as well? OK, sit down. Thank you, Ball. That was, that was great. That was terrific. Let me tell you what was going on. If we were in a physical and occupational session or a biofeedback session, we could have had monitors observing your physical reactions. We could have looked at how your muscles moved and where they were moving. But when we were working with a physical and occupational therapy patient, like the custodian who had their shoulders locked, what they weren't releasing their muscles. So by doing a few, and these are basically, uh, who has heard of Feldenkrais techniques? Who has not heard of Feldenkrais techniques? Moshe Feldenkrais was um, um, a person who was injured. They were paralyzed. They learned how to retrain their body's awareness. They wrote a nice book called Awareness Through Movement. And these techniques are described in some of the awareness through movement literature. But the more important point is all of the literature out there whether it's somatic in nature, becoming aware of the soma or the body or the muscles, whether it's um, neurophysiological in terms of the neurofeedback, all of, there's many, many literatures that inform biofeedback techniques. And we just applied one of them to show you some range of motion and how to increase your range of motion in a way that you weren't aware of before. But if you find yourself bracing, th think about the stress response in the following way. Imagine from an evolutionary perspective thousands of years ago when people used to live in caves. And if there's something rustling around outside of the cave, one of our first responses is, ah, what is that? In the extreme, we might even go to fetal position, which is adaptive. Big bones protect your core organs. Your shoulder towards your ear protects your neck and your carotid artery. That's an adaptive response. The second step is we resist the bad guy. We might yell and scream and pound our chests metaphorically, trying to scare them off, get out of here, this is my territory. The last one is we have to fight to protect our territory, territory or we have to run away because they're too big, they're going to eat us, or whatever. There's two steps before fight or flight. In the modern jungle, how often do we get to fight? Is fist fighting very common? We hear about it, but it's not very common. We get to run away at prescribed times, at lunchtime and at 6 o'clock or whatever it is. How often do you get to tell people, get out of here, you're bothering me. Tell your boss that, and you might get fired. Tell your professor that, and you might fail. Mostly, we get to grin and bear it, to hold it in. We brace, we tighten. When we tighten our blood vessels, we get less warm blood flowing. We get things like cold hands and feet, and we get hypertension, and we get ulcers and hemorrhoids and all kinds of and we get anger expression. We tighten up, and we get all kinds of emotional expressions. So bracing is one of the important parts of the relaxation component in biofeedback, but it's also about making people aware about what's going on. Mastery training in psychophysiological control, as well as enhancing a therapist's awareness, are two hand-in-hand -hand components. You're trying to improve mastery of the person by increasing their awareness about their own processes, and you're trying to help the therapist become aware so that they can guide your process better. So there's a, it's a two-way street in terms of the learning that goes on with biofeedback. Biofeedback is used in treating many, many kinds of things. Musculoskeletal dysregulation is a very common one. Physical and occupational therapists use muscle biofeedback extensively, or quite a bit. There's also stress research. So all of the stress and mind-body regulation processes are squarely at the center of what biofeedback practitioners engage in. We can also talk about essential hypertension, asthma, how to learn how to breathe better, gastrointestinal disorders, uh, abdominal pain, incontinence, insomnia, temporal mandibular joint syndrome, traumatic brain injury. This is important for the Gulf War and the Iraqi uh, soldiers returning home. Um, different types of addictions. I like the word dependency better than addiction, but addiction has a uh, certain cachet. Raynaud's disease is a particular type of disease that doesn't allow blood flow, so we get cold hands there. Hot flashes, menopause, as we were talking about earlier. Um, anxiety of many, many types. Attention deficit, hyperactivity disorders. Very interesting. I'm not going to talk too much about the research there, but I'll just do a brief piece. Sometimes people have a hard time waking up in the morning. It turns out that we have four basic brainwave patterns throughout the day that are in varying proportions. They're labeled beta, alpha, theta, and delta brainwave patterns. And when we shift 
from being asleep to being awake, we move from being more in the slow wave, the delta, theta, and alpha phase, into the more fast-paced beta phase. And we actually move through a phase called the sensory motor rhythm. The sensory motor rhythm is important for actually starting to move. When we start waking up, we're starting to roll over, stretch, and move around a little bit. We get our muscles going in a way to wake our brains up, to get it to a faster pace or a faster place neurologically. Again, I'm grossly oversimplifying. There's always been a mystery. Why is it that a stimulant medication like methylphenidate, like Ritalin, for example, why should a stimulant help ADHD kids calm down? Any thoughts on that? Because the medication is changing the brainwave pattern. It's allowing them to move into the beta phase where then they can attend and be alert and be present, as opposed to having to constantly try to shift or move their body to get to that same phase or same place. Again, I'm grossly oversimplifying, but what biofeedback, and in this case what neurofeedback does, is it helps the children learn how to move their own brainwave patterns to a faster place. And that takes about 40 to 50 to 100 sessions. It's a whole bunch of sessions. So it's not like the, you know, the short, few time biofeedback. Sometimes you just need a few sessions. Sometimes you need a whole bunch. But the point is, it can be done. Without medications, we can train people to change their brains. It's kind of the take home message. And I'm not going to talk too much more about the epilepsy and arthritis and chronic pain and headache. There's lots and lots of research about the efficacy, uh, and we'll talk about some of it. I put a few up here just as a sample. Incontinence and pelvic, chronic pelvic pain are two very important ones because they have been demonstrated to be not just as effective, but much more effective than the drugs and surgical approaches that are available. When people have incontinence, I'm, I'm talking about odds ratios of you know, uh, 2.1, about 200% more effective. When you look at the patients who are uh, uh, taking drugs and surgery and the patients that are using the biofeedback techniques, they're much more likely to get better faster, report less pain, and reduce the uh, level of incontinence or the frequency of incontinence um, by using biofeedback techniques. Temporal mandibular joint syndrome, and myographic or muscle pain is also very effective because we can place muscle sensors where we want. In fact, you can, the sensors are sometimes even smaller than these, and we'll pass, I'll pass some of these around in a little bit. But this is a, a triode. It's just a little sensor, and you place it on your jaw. And you can know when you're grinding your jaw, and you can train people to reduce the intensity and the frequency of their jaw grinding, as an example. And if they're sleeping, you can place a smaller sensor so it doesn't disrupt them rolling over and sleeping, but they can become aware directly about what's going on and how they're grinding at night. And it's not to wake them up, it's rather to chart it, and then you can find out what else is going on in their sleep ecology or their sleep cycle to enhance their awareness, to make changes, make better choices. So as opposed to just you know, numbing the pain, you're giving them an education about what their process is in relationship to their experiences. Recurrent abdominal pain, especially in little kids. Some of these stuff are, are just painful. Your stomach pains are just, oh, it hurts. So any of the recurrent abdominal pains and irritable bowel syndromes and gastrointestinal pain is one of the toughest things to deal with. But biofeedback is very, very effective at reducing systemic reductions in most of the symptomatology as opposed to specific. Sometimes you have to do something specific with the jaw or the shoulder or the, or the back or the head or whatever it is. And sometimes you just reduce arousal overall. And the patients that learn how to reduce their overall arousal usually reduce their pain reports. Headache, asthma, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, the list goes on. And we can continue. And there's some citations there for you to, to look up further. Question. So the question was about age. And does it matter what age you are in terms of biofeedback efficacy? And the short answer is no, it does not. You get a greater prevalence of symptoms as we age. Certain ages, you're going to get more hot flashes and incontinence and abdominal cramps and menstrual cramps, and that can be at any age. In some ages, you're getting more attention deficit in younger kids in terms of the hyperactivity disorder component of attention deficit. But it's an approach. It's a theoretical model. It's a, way, it's a conceptual framework for approaching issues beyond the pills beyond the surgical interventions. 
which is what Western medicine is exquisitely good at, but something else in addition could facilitate or enhance not only stress reduction, but of course healing and along the way. Yeah? We'll get to that. The question was, what about using hypnosis? And we'll talk about not just hypnosis, but relaxation and meditation and yoga, and, and we'll go down the list, yeah. Does it work for migraines? That's a great question. The short answer is yes. There's a longer piece to it because there's two general kinds of headaches. One we can call tension headaches and the other one migrainous headaches. Migrainous headaches, there's a whole theory about how they work with uh, different types of uh, short circuits of certain ner nervous pathways that in some cases, in fact, are probably even better treated medically with, ph with pharmacy. And that would go for probably a couple other things. We know that, that uh, uh, say, bipolar disorders, uh, some of the psychological disorders, are better treated pharmacologically or, or medically because th they work better. So it's not for everything. But to the extent that a migrainer can reduce some of the other symptoms that go along with migraine as well, using biofeedback adjunctively, I would say that pills, biofeedback alone, they work better together. And that's true with a lot of things. Psychotherapy, or take the pills, or do both together, you're better off when you combine things. And that, that's an opinion, but I think a lot of people would, would agree with that. Yeah. If something happens to somebody, they're in a car accident, compared to somebody inflicts some, some they've overdosed on medications or they're trying to commit suicide. So the patient, there's a, there's a patient belief model. There's half a dozen labels in literature that say patient belief or health belief model, but I'm gonna describe one of those many. And one of them has to do with, and maybe even Marty Rossman might touch on some of this. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll just describe it in words because it's hard to see in that corner of the board for everybody. There's four basic quadrants. The first one is the patient's belief about the technique. Then you have the clinician's or practitioner's or physician's belief about the technique. The second is the skill level of the physician, practitioner, clinician, as well as the skill level of the patient. So for example, if you have a very well-skilled clinician who believes very strongly in their technique, who meets up with a patient who gives lip service, I'm just here for my family. I don't really believe in your technique, even though some people say it works. But they're a good patient. They'll, they'll be adherent. They'll follow and they'll make their muscles move or they'll, in a pharmaceutical trial, they'll, they'll take their drugs regularly or medications regularly. So whatever it is, there's the skill level is there. That is to say the patient has the skill to receive the technique. The clinician has the skill to deliver the technique. The patient believes in the technique and the clinician believes in the technique. Those are the best outcomes. So if you have somebody who's self-inflicting and not necessarily adherent or going to resist, it's not going to work as well. And uh, same thing with acupuncture. Some physicians will go for, say, a, a short training session, and all of a sudden they believe acupuncture works, but they haven't had the years of practice with it. The patient believes in it, the physician believes in it, but their skill level isn't up to speed yet. So each of those four pieces has to be in place to get the best outcomes. And that's a little bit of a psychosocial model of, of, uh, of health belief. Did that answer your question? Okay. So again, biofeedback is used adjunctively when we deal with cancer patients and cancer pain. You have pre-surgery anxiety as well as post-surgical uh, recovery. Uh, chronic disorders, diabetes. We know that as people age, type 2 diabetics, uh, all of a sudden we know when you're under more stress, your insulin levels change. So if we can reduce arousal and reduce your stress, it can help you with your insulin levels. Um, childbirth, not in the emergent situation, not giving birth itself, but prior to the birth. And Western medicine is exquisitely good at the, at the urgent types of things. But leading up to that, you can use all kinds of patient education, including the biofeedback approaches, to make a person aware of how they're releasing their pelvic floor. Everybody for a moment. What I'd like you to do is do something called a modified Valsalva maneuver. Just go ahead and sort of tighten up your pelvic floor muscles and then release them. Okay? And, you, and one more time. And then release. And you can feel that, can't you? Well, sometimes if you're pregnant and you have a baby, a fetus, bearing down on some of your muscles, 
the awareness is not quite like it is if you're not pregnant. So we can use biofeedback techniques to raise awareness levels to increase the signal compared to the noise that might be going on for that person going through their childbirthing experience. So there, that's a very, very minor tip of the iceberg. There are many other techniques in biofeedback that are used for childbirthing. Um, in psychotherapy, peak performance. Uh, like I said, it's not just here's a line, you're below your line, you're in pain, you're in discomfort, you're not yourself. You want to get back to comfort zone. Instead, you want to go above and beyond your line. You want to enhance your performance. And biofeedback is also used to, to um, adjunctively to enhance performance. Question. <clears throat> Say that again. How does it work with insulin levels? Um, in a simple way, when we're under stress, we are calling the body to say, use more insulin. Because we're, when we're under stress, it's kind of like the fight or flight syndrome. So we're demanding more uh, glycogen stores to be released, more sugar goes into the bloodstream. That also says, I, I have a lot of sugar, but I'm not fighting or fleeing. Therefore, I need to have more insulin to get it back into you know, glycogen release. No, I'm sorry, glucagon release to get it back into glycogen. So there's, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get so technical. But, and that's also glossing over the details. But the sugar relationship is very important for diabetics. Stress, in general, will increase the the way that the body utilizes its sugar stores, as well as the way that it metabolizes sugars. And so the insulin and the glucagon, the two pancreatic hormones that are essential for the balance of blood sugar, are affected by stress levels. Biofeedback can help reduce the stress levels and help us better regulate our hormones that are related to sugar metabolism. <clears throat> How does biofeedback work with cancer patients? Typically, in terms of, well, there's, there's a long answer and a short answer, but the short answer is it helps them become more aware of their relationship and their process, how they watch their body, how they watch their pain, as well as it can even, to some degree, serve as a placebo effect. Because you can train a person using biofeedback techniques to become aware of the extent they didn't feel that they're relaxing, they're in their in a very difficult place. And we can say, oh, it turns out that this signal is showing us you, in fact, are changing your body or changing your action. It means you're probably going in the better direction, even slightly. And we can start with that slight wedge in the door to build on some relief or release for that cancer patient that then says there's hope. And we can build on that hope to help them. And I'm, again, I'm glossing over. There are protocols for all of the things that I'm describing. A protocol is usually several pages long, and it says, do these things in this order, you will then come out with a better outcome. And again, that's, that's why it's listed as more adjunctive. Yeah. <clears throat> the short answer is probably yes. <laughs> that's a qualified yes. It depends on what type of cancer. Cancer is unregulated cell growth, depending on which cells, what type of cancer, what stage the cancer patient is in. You will have varying studies that will say biofeedback adjunctive therapy with stress reduction relaxation can facilitate the, the process. And there are people that are arguing on both sides. Yes, it helps a lot. Yes, it helps a little. Yes, it helps not at all. You typically have three lines. It helps, increase and improves. Nothing happened, it stayed the same. Or it went down, it made things worse. Very few of the studies, and I don't know of any of the studies, that have ever said it makes things worse, if anything that says there is null effect or no effect. So on all the studies that I'm aware of, they either didn't do any harm or it did a did bunch of good. The question is, how much good did it do? And that will vary by the type of cancer, by the type of design in the study and the protocol. And I can give you tons and tons of 15 weeks of material to, uh, to show you if you need it. And I'll be glad to talk to you after. And what I'd like to do is answer any questions that you have on this line as we go along, and I'm glad to take them. And if I'm not answering them to any detail that you want, let me know and say, that's not good enough, let's keep going. Because if that's where the, where the audience wants to go, we'll go there. Question back here. The question was, if your head is so noisy, if there's a lot of chatter in the brain, do you have to first quiet down the chatter? Or what tools are available through biofeedback to help quiet the chatter that will enable you then to deal with cancer, or diabetes, or, or any other types of issues. 
When I mentioned earlier that there are multi-page protocols done in a particular sequence or a particular order, most of them start with how do we quiet down the noise so that then we can choose which signal we want to amplify. And again, that's a general, generic kind of statement, but that's pretty much how most of the protocols go. And in a little while, we'll talk about what a typical biofeedback session is. We'll run through a stress profile. Hopefully, we'll get somebody to volunteer for that. And we'll show you how that works. Question? Ah, that's a good question. I anticipated going on to this slide next, and the question that came from the floor is about this slide. This is a slide of physicians' use of holistic therapies, things that are other than drugs and surgery for the most part. This is a percentage of physicians. It's hard to read, I'm sorry. The yellow represents the percentage of physicians who will refer people to use that approach. The second bar, the gray, is the percentage of physicians of uh, percentage of physicians that use the technique themselves. So the percentage of physicians that will tell their patients, go ahead and go learn some relaxation techniques. Okay? About 22% of physicians use relaxation techniques themselves. Remember that we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. Humans are self-referential. They're going to use themselves as a reference first and assume that it is true for others until they hear some other, something else differently. If I said, go and relax, how do you relax? If a physician said to you, go and relax, what are some examples? How do you relax? Vacation. Who else? How do you relax? Swim. Who else? Take walks. Who else? Get a massage. Get a massage. Well, massage is up there. Who else? Anybody else? When you relax, what do you do? Reading. It goes down the list. We have a long list of how do you relax. Is that the same for everybody? Okay. It's idiosyncratic. So when a physician says go and relax, what does that mean? But when a physician says go and get biofeedback for your muscle pain, go and get biofeedback for your cancer pain, go and get biofeedback for your TMJ, for etc., that is very specific. And there are specific protocols for those techniques. The reason that biofeedback is so well respected is because it's partly a conceptual framework, but it's well within the medical model. When you go into a hospital, you have gajillions of types of instruments that can measure physical reactions. When you go into a biofeedback practitioner's office, you have usually some simple devices that are designed to raise your awareness about what's going on in a very precise, specific way. So again, and there are other techniques. Yes, massage is well respected, and hypnotherapy, and this is going back to your hypnosis techniques. It's but about you know, 60 some odd percent. 50%, 56 approximately uh, will recommend acupuncture of different types, meditation, Meditation as a technique varies. And you know, dealing with babies is also a good technique. And when you bring babies into a space, or puppy dogs, or plants, it usually livens things up, even if they're squawking. That's my son, by the way, in the back. <laughs> we took him out trick-or-treating, and he's, it's past his bedtime. So, um, Diet and yoga, et cetera, it goes down from there. Uh, comments, questions, uh, yeah. That's a good question. Why don't the physicians use all these techniques? Uh, that's, that's a whole other lecture <laughs> question. <laughs> Diet is really low. Yeah, well, uh, a lot of people... Uh, a lot, either they forget about it. How much medical education do we get in diet and nutrition these days? How many medical training hours are in diet and nutrition? Is it a lot? No, very little was the comment. So this is picked up on your own. This is general knowledge. But again, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And they're going to recommend whatever is heard about or true or they picked up along the way. It's just a snapshot. It's just the point that biofeedback is not something you know, that's been, it's been around for probably several decades in terms of the current techniques. That's instrumented techniques, using equipment. But yoga, for example, I could argue, is thousands of years old and is also a biofeedback technique. It just doesn't use instruments. And we'll do some non-instrumented techniques in a little while. <clears throat> Here's a typical biofeedback session. First, the clinician will say, what do you want to understand? They'll design a language and a process that will help you understand what's going on in the session. The most important piece is that you're helping to reassure the client or the patient that they have control over their own circumstances. Sessions are typically 10 minutes to an hour. 
depending on what it is. The actual time with equipment is relatively small. It's usually 10 to 30 minutes, but the typical sessions could run up to 60 minutes. 60% of the practitioners are most likely to be psychologists. When we look at the national professional societies, they're dominated probably two-thirds with psychologists. So a lot of psychologists will use biofeedback techniques, but not all. Physical and occupational therapists, physicians' offices, nurses, etc. It goes on for any of the health practitioners. Sometimes it can be high touch, as in the case of physical therapy, where you're actually moving things around and uh, touching the patient's body. Many times it's complementary or adjunctive or in addition to something else that's going on. You're getting some psychological counseling, you're taking some medications, and you're doing biofeedback. This is a little bit of vocabulary, a little bit of vocabulary. <clears throat> Everybody's heard of ECG or EKG, electrocardiograph. How many of you have heard of electrodermograph? Dermograph. Well, what we passed around, a little handheld monitor, derma for skin. So you're getting a skin response, and that's an electrodermograph. It's sometimes called electrodermal activity. Sometimes it's called a galvanic skin response. Uh, there's any number of skin conductance response. There's any number of acronyms that are out there. But just to be consistent, I just sort of simplified it. EEG, encephalograph for the brain, electroencephalograph. EMG, electromyograph, myo for muscle. And then there's respiration and temperature. And some people might even consider adding on some other acronyms out there, like, like a uh, um, ERG for electrospirograph or ETG for electrotemporograph. But those, those terms don't exist. I don't want to start coining phrases. But I think in one of the earlier slide sets, that was one of the uh, comments. But E is usually electro and G is usually graph on any of these terms. And there are, there are dozens others. You can take an electrogastrograph about what's going on in your gastric system, which is a very interesting one, but I don't want to go there right now because I don't want to put in sensors on anybody's belly right tonight. So, okay. So what we have is ways to assess what's going on for a person in their lives in general. So the first thing that might happen in a biofeedback session is to get a baseline to find out what's going on um, in their lives. And one of the ways is we profile their stress reactions. Earlier when I showed the slides of the woman who reacted to the sighing, sigh three times, or clapping sound, those are typical expected reactions. We want to find out whether the individual is responding as we would expect or whether we have to make visible the invisible. Whether when they close their eyes we would expect a relaxation response, but that person, or when you close your eyes, you get a constriction in your blood vessel. So we do a profile of your stress reactions. There are three big categories of things that are simulated that we'll show you in a minute, that I'll show you in a minute. One is the ambiguity or uncertainty response. A lot of times we face things that are uncertain to us. Ambiguity is stressful. I don't know what's going on, I don't know what's expected of me, I don't know what they want. And that can result Biofeedback technicians can help us reduce ambiguity, uncertainty, time pressure. How many of us have time pressure in our lives? Is that omnipresent? It's a very commonplace experience. And the last is emotional upset, interpersonal conflict, things along those lines. These are the big, most common everyday types of stressful sources. So I need, some, I need a volunteer who's willing to be connected to a whole bunch of wires and sensors. Come on down. And because it's connected to the laptop that I have up here, I'm going to switch gears. Thank you. Yeah, have, yeah, have a comfortable chair. I'm going to make you comfortable. And does anybody want to learn a little bit about this? You feel free to come on up and you can connect up the help me connect up the sensors. Does anybody want to be an applied clinic, clinical person? Come on down. All right. So one of the first things that we'll do is we'll place something around breathing. Because breathing is important. If you don't breathe in, breathing well, you're, you're dead. So we, we have to uh, uh, set up your breathing. So I'm going to place it. Lift up your arms for a moment. And I'm going to place this in Velcro stuck. OK, so we come from the side. Um, and the reason coming from the side is important is um, if somebody is uh, experiencing some type of trauma in their lives and you come at them straight on, 
that might be problematic. So there's a bunch of techniques that you learn about how to place or apply the sensors. I did it loosely at first because one of the things that you want to do is when a person's really tight and they can't breathe, that's stress inducing. So when you're first placing the sensors on, you want to apply them loosely and then eventually tighten them up and we'll calibrate the sensors. There's a second set of sensors and um, what I'd like to do is, is uh, pass around a few of these just so you all get to see what they are and you can sort of um, pass them down. Here, here's a couple over here. And just to add one over here, just pass it back. And these are you know, basically big band-aids and, and you peel them off and place them on the skin. And that's how they come on and off. And what I'd like to do is place these big band-aid sensors on your shoulders. So I'm gonna place one over here and one over here. Is that okay? Good. And Yes, the question was, is this pretty much like a lie detector? <laughs> We're going to get the interrogation experts out here. They're flying in from Langley, Virginia right now as we speak. And, um, you know, <laughs> the, I'm not going to talk about waterboarding, but <laughs> I'm going to place this one here. Say again. No, no, don't take it off. Just pass around. The th you don't have to take it off. You can pay, take it off or not, but, but, but that's how they come off. I was just saying, but feel free to pass it around just so you see what it's like. Um, whereas this device, the handheld device, had the little two metal things, there's a, a smaller one uh, here, and they're just attached with Velcro. Feel free to take your right hand. Why don't you can feel free to put these on? Um, go ahead and... Um, you can put this on yourself or adjust these. We're just going to put these in the middle pad of your finger. Go ahead and use your other hand if you want. Or you can put it on either hand. It doesn't matter. Okay. And we have a second one. So why don't we put it over here. Who has seen Star Trek? The old Star Trek. Who's seen the old Star Trek? Who knows what the the greeting that Mr. Spock has, or the live long and prosper. Everybody sees this? Okay. Who has heard of the term dermatome? Dermatome. What's a dermatome? Who knows what, who, who knows what a dermatome is? So there's, there's a, a map of the spinal cord nerves to the surface of the body. And the spinal cord nerves map out, and it turns out that uh, there's a few different dermatomes or surface level of the skin that map onto different spinal cord nerves, and they sort of go along in this pattern. So if we want to get a broader signal, we place some of the sensors on one side and some of the sensors on the other side of the dermatome. If we want to get the same, a narrower signal, we place them on these two fingers. So if we want to get a broader signal, we place them on one on here and one on here. Does that kind of make sense? Tell me if it needs more explanation. So in this case, I'm doing a broad signal. I'm placing one on this finger and one on this finger in order to get a, a broad signal and cross dermatomes. And then the last is, um, put this on your thumb and place it somewhat like this. And this is Edward Scissorhands kind of, kind of approach. Yeah, go ahead and do it. Yeah. And make yourself comfortable. All of these little, little um, um, sensor wires, um, you know, if a person has to go up to go to the bathroom really quickly, they, they quickly disconnect. It's all just Velcro. Anybody's welcome to come up and take a look and, and see. I'm going to shift gears for a moment. I need to um, turn this down, go over here. Then open up, and let's see if that works. And it's not. It's not. It's not coming in. All right. Um, well, embarrassed, inconvenient. So if embarrassment and inconvenience is the worst thing they have to suffer in life, it's actually a good day. All right. Um, yeah, it's one of those types of things. In the interests of time, in the interests of time, I'll turn this down. What I'd like to do is thank you very much. Uh, you know, <laughs> interesting. Um, it's very easy to take these off. And again, you know, it's one of those things that, that happens. If you want, you can keep it on. We can actually do it afterwards. It, it depends on in terms of these, but I can take these off if you're, if you're interested. And that way, you can actually move around. And um, yeah, oh, Velcro just comes right off. Good. Now, notice something. All we did was just take off Velcros and wires. 
So if you need to get up very quickly, it's easy. Imagine being on a surgical table. If you, if you have an epidural in, can you get up and very, very quickly go? Yeah, it relieves your pain, but you can't jump out of bed. So it's a very, very useful thing. Nothing's being done to you. Thank you, and we'll, we'll try to come back. I'll just leave them on there for a little bit, and I can probably get it working. All right. So this was, this was just after the, the stress profile, and then the humor was, now I want you to completely relax. <laughs> because sometimes you get all the wires connected up, and it's hard to relax because these are unfamiliar things, at least the first time. And the reassurance is very, very important. That it's, it's just a way to start understanding your own uh, process. And some people look at physiological interactions as something mysterious. One of the important pieces about a biofeedback session is that you can touch everything. It's just Velcro. It snaps on and off. It's just the worst case is it's like a Band-Aid being on your um, shoulder or something like that. And that's, that's very, very important. And yes, there are, are people who are sensitive to adhesives or sensitive to Velcro. You must ask that. I, I didn't ask, but are you sensitive to adhesives or Velcro? Thank you. <laughs> One less bit of stress, which is good. Here's what happens when one of the things we would do in a stress profile. Go ahead and think about road rage. Just the thoughts alone, like the lemonade, change your body. And here's what's happening. We can change the thoracic or abdominal breathing patterns. We can monitor those. In this case, we just had a single respiratory monitor around the, the thorax, actually closer to the midsection is where we're going to place it. But you can do one up in the upper chest and one in the lower chest. So we'll do something about breathing in a little bit. But just, yeah, I'll, I'll hold off on that in terms of breathing. We can look at how the heart rate changes, and we can look at the rate of respiration. And if we think about thinking about road rage, notice how sort of erratic or dysregulated the breathing pattern is, and how the heart rate is going sort of up and down in sort of these little jagged peaks. Now let's go ahead and let go and relax. After a bit of time, we notice that we get long, slow, regular breathing patterns in the upper and the lower body, and as well, regular patterns in the heart rate. We're trying to smooth out the system. We're trying to optimize performance, increase our awareness overall. The question was about biochemical factors in the blood. There are three basic systems that are measured mostly in research. The first are cardiorespiratory responses, because you know a whole bunch about the blood pressures and the heart rates and the breathing patterns, et cetera. The second two are neuroendocrine and neuroimmune interactions. How the hormones are released are neuroendocrine, and how the immune system responds to help us fight of disease are neuroimmune responses. You'll hear presentations about the neuroendocrine from Professor Appel. You'll hear presentations about the immune system from Professor Kemeny. You heard discussions about the thought processes and the imagery processes from Professor Rossman. Those are very, very important things to measure. Now, let's go back in an oversimple way. What is it that we're measuring when we take a blood sample, for example, and we're using getting a biochemical assay of the hormonal system as it changes? Well, we know that different types of stress hormones will vary. One of the stress hormones is called cortisol. Cortisol has a circadian rhythm. It's greater at certain times of the day than at others. We also know that the immune system has a little pulsatile or cyclical variation. So it's not just what we're measuring, that is to say the dosage or the intensity of response, but when we're measuring it as well. That also goes for heart rate and blood pressure. We know that if you were to monitor each one of our heart rates and blood pressures throughout the day, it's going to vary quite a bit, in fact. It'll be higher midday and lower as you go to sleep. So depending on when you're taking a sample will very much determine what your readings are. So from a research standpoint, you always want to be consistent, have the same patient the same time of day, as well as identify that they've cleared other things out of their system. Are there other medications on board that are uh, interfering or changing their hormonal level, their immune reactions, or their cardiorespiratory functioning, as an example? So you ask a really good question. It unpacks a lot of other questions. But from a biofeedback perspective, it almost doesn't matter. What matters is where a person starts and where they end so if a person comes in with a lot of drugs on board and a lot of other medications, a lot of surgical pain, et cetera, whether they're at the most extreme end starting, we can say wherever you are, 
let's go ahead and progress, uh, measure the progressive change, hopefully reducing your symptomatology, reducing your pain levels, et cetera. And then we can use any number of outcome markers. If we're willing, and in a study, we might draw blood and getting a biochemistry to find out their hormonal and their immune system changes and other types of changes. We might get an assay of their medication levels. But the outcomes in biofeedback are going to be pretty much things like heart rate, breathing rate, muscle tension, um, sweat response, temperature reactions, those types of things. More questions along those lines? Okay. <clears throat> so this is the road rage slide. And you can look at the stress hormones. When you're thinking of road rage, you're going to be releasing some stress hormones. The typical pattern in establishing a baseline in a biofeedback session is a seesaw, a sawtooth pattern. Up here, use the laser pointer. Up in this section, it says rest. Then we do this task called color words. It's a Stroop task. If this thing was, if the computer was working well, then you would have seen. Who has not seen the Stroop task? So most of you. Stroop task is, imagine if you could, the word red printed in the color blue. And you were asked, to identify the color of the letters instead of reading the word. Now imagine that these discombobulated word color pairs are flashed on the screen very rapidly. And you sometimes get confused and say, uh, 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 blue, no red, no red, blue, because there's a confusion. Do you identify the color of the letters or do you read the word? And the first impulse is to read the word as opposed to identify the letter of the colors. So that task is one that's stressful for most people, and it's firing up in the brain the areas of the interior cingulates, and this is Beaumont's work in, in McGill University in Canada. He talks a lot about the, um, the, the reactions of the brain and the body to color word ambiguity, and we know a lot about that as a stress-inducing technique to establish a baseline. The second one, so we have the patient rest again, or client rest again, then we go through a math stress. A math stress is very simple. How many of you can add, subtract, multiply, divide? Everybody, right? Who wants to be a guinea pig again? Anybody? All right, I, I won't put anybody through torture. Imagine if you could, subtracting by the number seven very rapidly, starting with a big number. If I said start with 1,081 and quickly start subtracting the number seven. All right, go. <laughs> you no know, volunteers, and all of a sudden you're asking me to volunteer. What, did your heart just leap? Did, did something happen? How could you, how could, you know, how do you do these things? You're not at being asked to do math. You're being asked to perform under time pressure and be evaluated under your performance. So that's very stressful, and that's a standard stressor. These are very common standards. Um, uh, color words is our ambiguity. Math stressors are time pressure simulators. And then you rest again, and you think of something stressful. And then in this case, there's a whole bunch of little markers on here. See this word talk? They're talking about something stressful. And then we have a whole bunch of markers in there. These were different types of events that went on um, over here in these little mini types of reactions. And just what was going on with the patient, they started fidgeting and moving and getting very squirmy because of what they were talking about. So the typical pattern of response is when you're resting, you're sort of low. When you start anticipating an event coming up, we start increasing our arousal then it's higher, and then we start getting better at it, we start going down again, we rest again, and then we start coming up to the next thing, we anticipate, we go higher, and then we go down again, and up, down, up, down, up, down. And that's an oversimple, very typical pattern of stress reaction. Compared to, say, the client who we set up breathing as sighing as one of their stressors, we set up the loud clap as a different stressor, and then for them, eyes closed was stressful because there was lack of control. It's very idiosyncratic. You as the client or patient coming in will determine what it is that you need to get out of the session to find out how your body reacts. And then the third biofeedback technician or clinician will decide what's the best protocol to apply. Great point. It's not a matter of good or bad, but who the person is and how they respond. Think of things not in terms of right and wrong and good and bad. What makes something right is that it's consistent with your hypothesis, your theory, the, the model that you're setting up. What makes something wrong is when it's inconsistent. What makes something good or bad, it's good when it's useful, when, it, when, it, when it's helping the client or patient. And that, that's what makes it good for them. And it is, again, customized or personalized for you. 
This is another similar pattern that looks at color words and then rest and then math. And in this case, um, you can look at the changes that occur dysregulated up at the top line, then more regular and consistent when they're resting, and then more agitated when they're in the middle of, of some activity. So it's blowing up or expanding what was, it's making visible the invisible. Sometimes you don't know how much you're stressing out, and you can use the biofeedback equipment to amplify or to make more visible the things you might not have been aware of before. <clears throat> so as a summary, biofeedback is useful for monitoring many physiological systems and raising your body awareness and its responses to the environment. Applied psychophysiology and biofeedback helps you increase your awareness so that you can change for the better. And there are a couple of references down here as well as on your bibliography. Getting back to the question about how do you find clinicians and trainers, certifications, the Biofeedback Certifying Institute of America, BCIA, has roughly a 48-hour training blueprint. This is just to get you started. So you need to work on any number of areas on a consistent basis before you then do your clinical training hours. It's sort of like you just need this as your didactic and then the experiential are working with clients and patients hands-on for X number of hours, depending on what your professional requirements are. So people that say they are BCIA certified, people that say that they are tr trained in applied psychophysiology and biofeedback and have a certification or a certificate of some type, have probably followed this professional standard as a rubric for their training. In a moment, I'll put up a slide with some websites. So for example, the bcia.org, AAPB is Applied Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback. They have their annual conference coming up in May in Daytona Beach, Florida this year. Um, the BFE is the Biofeedback Federation of Europe. So the Europeans, including the Russians, huge biofeedback. Supposedly there's more biofeedback going on in Russia than almost any other country. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, ISNR, the International Society for Neuroregulation, neuro meaning brain regulation. So the emphasize neurofeedback. There's also a BSC, Biofeedback Society of California, and that's biofeedbackcalifornia.org. Um, and the thing, I'm past president as well as current board member of the Biofeedback Society in California. And this is my contact information. The San Francisco State Holistic Health Studies Program is incredibly evolved. It's one of the best ones that I know. It's the reason that I'm at San Francisco State versus anywhere else. You cannot get a full-on undergraduate training and, and or master's level students coming in to get training in holistic, integrative, complementary, and alternative techniques. We teach classes in Eastern and Western perspectives in holistic health and Chinese medicine and acupuncture and Ayurvedic medicine and homeopathy as well as biofeedback, psychophysiological techniques and healing, stress reduction and relaxation. That's offered even at the undergraduate level. You can get bachelor's degree levels of education in this stuff as opposed to few courses here and there. UC San Francisco does offer courses in complementary and alternative medicine. The Osher Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine has biofeedback practitioners. Teresa Corrigan is fantastic. Go and look her up and visit the center and get a biofeedback session. You'll love it. But at the same time, please absolutely feel free to take advantage of the local resources in San Francisco. We're going to finish up here. I'm available for questions, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining me on this Halloween evening. Thank you so much.